Welcome everybody. My name is Sarah Eisen. I'm from CNBC. I co-anchor Worldwide Exchange and Squawk on the Street, two of our daily shows based in New York uh, from the Stock Exchange. And I am very honored to be here with you today to talk about one of the hottest topics, I can tell you, on business news in 2016, and I know it will continue to be so in 2017. So welcome to our panel. It's about building trust in the healthcare industry. Welcome to our distinguished panelists, whom I'll, I will introduce them to you in just a moment. But just as a, a little bit of a setup to the discussion, I wanted to talk about some of the headlines from 2016 in healthcare. It was a rough year. I think everyone might agree for healthcare, both in the markets and in the news, from Mylan's price hike of the life saving EpiPen, or Martin Screlly, so called Pharma Bro, who got a lot of news coverage uh, and who increased the price of a critical age, AIDS drug by more than 5,000%. Valiant Pharmaceuticals, its price raises. Theranos' blood testing issues and its blow up, the headlines and the outlet rage left, left many wondering whether there's a trust problem when it comes to healthcare, dealing with its patients and putting profits before patients. Now the government is certainly on the case. Senators are, have called for hearings. We heard a lot about it on the campaign trail from both presidential candidates. It continues to be so with the president-elect bringing up pharma last week, getting away with murder. Uh, but that was 2016, and now we're starting fresh with 2017, and we've got some key industry leaders to talk about some solutions and some ways we can have some forward thinking from those in this room and how they can partner with governments and with doctors and with hospitals and with patients. So let me introduce our panel to you. We have Franz van, Lu van Houten, the president and CEO of Royal Phillips, also a co-chair here at the World Economic Forum. We have Ian Reid, who is the chairman and CEO of Pfizer. We have Rich Lesser, who is the CEO of Boston Consulting Group and is a specialist on healthcare. We have George Barrett, who's the president and CEO of Cardinal Health. And we have John Milligan, the president and CEO of Gilead Sciences. So welcome to you all. How I thought we could do this conversation is talk a little bit about some of the issues in the news, front and center. I'm sure everybody wants to know your reactions to some of the comments that we've heard from the president-elect and some of the, the hot button topics, and then move into a broader discussion about how to really create solutions for a system. What is value-based healthcare? How do we achieve it? How do we increase transparency, data, and most importantly, medical outcomes? So Franz, I'll start with you. Is there a trust problem in the healthcare industry? Well, it's funny you ask a technology company whether there's a trust issue, but let me give you a kind of a broader landscape on this question. First of all, health and healthcare is a very big market and it has many, many players. Providers, eh, doctors, uh, insurance company, government and regulators, um, pharma companies, technology companies, labs, you name it. So it's very wide. So I don't think you can paint everybody with one brush. That wouldn't go. And, and, and you know, if we put the patient at the center of this discussion, the advancements that are being made in healthcare at this time are phenomenal, right? And they deliver great promise to patients. And while we also live in the internet age and social media have give people access to all that information, they want to have access to the best. And if they then at the same time maybe feel that either because of an insurance policy or because of price or because of other reasons, they are being uh, held away from what could be a treatment for their loved ones who maybe have cancer or an other serious disease, then people get upset because it is about them. Right? So if there is a trust issue, uh, I think we need to recognize that there is a lot of emotion at stake where people really want to live well and return to a healthy lifestyle or want the best for their family and want to have access to the best there is. Now we know that medicine advances, that is great, and I think many of the companies here have their contribution to that. Uh, we invest in research and development to make these advances possible. Um, and that needs to be paid for. Now, so on the one hand you see precision health around the corner. Wouldn't that be great that you can get specifically for your disease a treatment that works first time? You know, you diagnose quickly, you treat fast, you go home and you recover. 
I think that's the holy grail. Um, we are making advancements to make that possible, but it has a price. So it, 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 it is very logical that there is then also a discussion about, well, it better works. Right. And uh, we only pay if it works. Value-based care, outcome-based care. I think that's a trend that is going to happen. You know, whether there is a repeal and replace or whatever law we talk about, most countries in the world somehow will move to outcome-based care, uh, where, uh, let's say, every, every actor in the system will be held accountable to deliver. That also applies to us as a technology company. Uh, if we are instrumental to diagnosis or minimally invasive treatment, we need to be part of the outcome-based care. So we have, for example, been shifting towards contracts with providers to say, you know, we want to be a participant in your productivity <coughs> targets so that, you know, we, we push outcomes and we push productivity at the same time. Um, so overall, I, I would, probably vote that um, maybe there's trust issues around the fringes, but overall health and healthcare is a fabulous industry that really help people. How do you put a price, John, on a life-saving drug? You were one of the early poster children for this with the hep C treatments, $1,000 a pill, $74,000 for one month supply. How did you deal with that? What are some lessons learned? Well, we, we didn't deal with it very well. I think we didn't talk about it enough. I mean, it's the interesting thing. It is still your headline. It is still the headline that gets written, despite the fact that the prices have come down by more than half. So rather than raising prices, we've lowered prices very dramatically. It doesn't get talked about very often. Part of it is because we run, we run in a very non-transparent system. There are literally hundreds of groups that we deal with in the United States. There are hundreds of different people and organizations that we have to negotiate contracts with, all of which are, of course, confidential because none of the groups want the other groups knowing what goes on. So we have to talk about things in generalities. But So now you've got, uh, let's take hepatitis C, very difficult disease to treat, um, enormous side effects of previous treatment. Patients often couldn't come on treatment because of comorbidities. Now we can treat nearly everybody. The, the cure rates are extraordinarily high. It's incredibly safe. The price has come down and still what we hear about is, uh, is two years ago when the list price was high. So there's a lack of transparency. Um, relative to most other kind of modalities, this is a good bargain. And remember, it's not a therapy year after year after year. It's 12 weeks, eight for some, and you're done. And then the system reaps the reward later on. It really does benefit the entire ecosystem it goes on. What's the problem with that? Again, we have a fragmented system. The pharmaceutical budget is one thing, the hospital budget is another, outpatient budget is another. The system that gains may not be the system that pays. And so that is another issue that we're having to deal with everywhere, that the benefit that we provide may not be uh, seen by someone else. For example, Medicaid is not treating many patients in the United States right now. Why is that? Well, it seems like they're hoping they'll age into Medicare so somebody else will have to pay for it. Medicare pays for it because they're going to have this patient for the remainder of their life, and they know that they get great benefit from that from their system. In fact, the payback is only on the order of a couple of years based on the savings that they've calculated. Same with big groups like Kaiser and others. They've calculated this is a really valuable thing. We talk about value medicine. Often we're talking about cost, but the value to their system is very, 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 very high. So Ian, you know where I'm going to go next when it comes to prices. Um, maybe I'll read for you a direct quote from what we heard from President-elect Trump last week. Pharma companies are, quote, getting away with murder. Pharma has had a lot of lobbies and a lot of lobbyists and a lot of power, and there's very little bidding on drugs. We're the largest buyer of drugs in the world, and yet we don't bid properly. And we're going to start bidding, and we're going to save billions of dollars. Is he right? So, well, let me just go back a little bit to your original question, and I'll get to where um, the president-elect was or is. I think the issue of trust is a, is a problem of perception, and trust where? If you go into Asia or Latin America, the trust of the industry is probably 80% on, on the indices of trustworthy. When you get into Europe and the United States, it drops and it drops for our industry, it drops for physicians, it drops for insurance companies, because the system is terribly complicated and not transparent. So, you know, I, and, uh, and I feel that in, that in that sense that, that perhaps the pharmaceutical industry has not done a good job of communicating, but most people don't understand that, and I was in a pharmacy the other day, and a 
an older lady was trying to buy some medicine. She was complaining, she was getting some pills, and she said, it can't cost them that much to make these pills. That's not the point. The pill is irrelevant. It's the knowledge you have to accumulate to make the pill. The pill is a vehicle of delivering knowledge, well, curative knowledge. And that's what our consumers don't understand because we're not close enough to them and we can't talk to them directly. We talk to them through intermediates, like the physicians, like the insurance companies. They perceive healthcare costs increasing on themselves, not because our prices are increasing. The branded pharmaceutical prices in 2015, the, the patent protected prices in the United States went up 2.8%. What's the problem? Went up 2.8%. The trouble is it's a perception again. There are two pharmaceutical markets. There's an ethical market, people who do research, who pe people who price responsibly, who price to recover their cost of capital. And there's another part of the pharmaceutical industry that is generic. And they don't do that, which is where you are with Mylan, where you are with Scarelli, probably where you are with Valiant, who didn't do any research. So there are two different worlds. So I would say there's a perception issue of who is pharma. And most of the problem uh, of, the, of the reputation has come from those that I don't consider part of the ethical pharmaceutical business. Let's go back to the president-elect. I think um, at this stage he probably hasn't been briefed as much as, as, as he will be briefed to the extent of competition there is in the system. Um, Medicare, which is a huge um, undertaking that was put in place for the drug benefit uh, by the Republicans some years ago, has come in 40% below its original costs and the premiums in Medicare, on average, over six years have gone up $10. $10 for the whole six years. So once again, I think there's a perception issue out there. And then on the other side, of course there's bidding. We bid all the time with insurance companies. And, and, we, and you know, you have, you, it's very difficult to get a but product But not government. Not Governments buy through the insurance companies. Mm -hmm. And on Medicaid, they have a best price policy which was the agreement we had with the, the government, that this is an underprivileged part of society and Medicaid would get the best, the lowest price we sell our product to, plus an additional discount that states insist upon. And then we also have a non-commercial price for the veterans. So once again, it's a misperception and it's a very complicated industry. So I think once uh, the president-elect gets briefed on this, he will perceive there is a huge amount of bidding and extremely aggressive um, uh, purchasing. And yet, Rich, he is a populist, and there is outrage over high drug prices, despite what Ian says, whether it's a com communication failure on part of the industry or not. What do you see as a solution? Is this something that the industry can self-police, or do you expect Republicans and Democrats to both get on board with this? It's so hard to predict. I mean, the main thing that we're living in right now is the difficulty to predict on how legislation is going to flow in the months ahead. And even both both the president himself and, and the or president elect himself, excuse me, and the leaders in Congress have had different positions over time. I do think, as it relates to some of the medicines or um, therapies that are off patent for long periods of time, a bit more industry discipline. I mean, when we look at other industries that have been challenged with different practices. I think industries have often stepped up to set a set of guidelines about what are reasonable expectations and to do a little bit more self-monitoring and more transparency and involving others without it resorting to government and legislation that has been more productive to address the problem areas without the second order consequences in other areas. Please. I just don't see the self-regulation around pricing. I just don't see it because every entity needs to make its return its cost of capital. And I don't think it's appropriate in a system where you need price signaling to decide the allocation of resources. How do you sources. look at the situations around, the ones that you cited around? Well, I the, think the, the, the Myland situation is just clearly a regulatory failure, as is a lot of generics that don't come to market. You have an FDA, which is, it, which is in charge of the safety and the efficacy of drugs, and you have a set of complicated rules about what AV rated means. So the reason the monopoly was maintained on the, uh, on the, on the EpiPen was because of instructions in the packaging insert. 
Nothing about to do with the drug. Nothing about whether the drug delivers the same quantity of product to the, to, or the injection does that. The instructions to use the device, or the generic device, was different from the instructions to use the, the, the pen, and hence it was not a generic. It was not AB rated. It's a, it's a failure of regula regulations. George, I know you do, you do have something to add here. You guys have looked at the bad actors, if you will, who's actually raising prices, and you have a unique lens into who's yeah. doing it and how big yeah. of a problem it is. So let me, I'll do that first, but then I want to back up to the bigger question that you asked. Sure. If it's okay. Yes. So we have a bit of a unique lens at Cardinal Health on the healthcare system, and particularly in the U.S., where we touch probably 75% of the hospitals every day, probably 25,000 pharmacies every day, and clinics, the fleet, whole system. Um, if you look at the last couple of years, and let's talk about the, and we look at the largest price increasers by percentages. I went through this at one point, I've been in the industry for 30 years with our group, and I looked at 10 names, and two of them I recognized. Eight of them were players that had entered the market as sort of financial engineers, temporarily, and didn't have a long-term perspective. Long-term perspective oh. view. And the damage that that can do to trust is really mm -hmm. big. So I, I probably would highlight that. For, I'd also highlight, and this Ian may not love, but if you look across 4,000 generic drugs, because we, we touch both branded and generic drugs, we have to. That's our, as, as the part of our business that's in pharmaceutical distribution. What we saw during a period of time was probably 400 drugs out of 4,000 raising in price, as opposed to the historical norm, which was about 150 or 200. So the reality was, on, and that's already sort of flip back more towards the norm. So I'm not sure that systemically that's our, 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 our big issue. But let me just back up to the trust issue. So I, I, if I could, mm -hmm. it's not just about trust in the healthcare. This is a broad issue of trust between people and their institutions. You could go to energy companies. You could go to any number of fields around the world. And you'd find that there's been a breakdown of trust. And I think Edelman this morning published their data on, on trust. This is a huge issue. And I think perhaps as CEOs, maybe we've underestimated the imp implications of breakdown in trust and what that does in terms of com uh, causing bad policy. Or the search for blame, by the way. <coughs> the search for blame, I would argue, is the enemy uh, to the search for solutions. You always go in the wrong direction. And I can give you a minute, million examples of that. So I do think that fr from our standpoint, this is part of a bigger picture of trust between people and their institutions. I do think we, we feel it in healthcare. I do think that certain players have contributed disproportionately to that. And I think that uh, there are ways for us to rebuild trust. But I don't think it's just rebuilding trust in healthcare. I think as leaders, it's rebuilding trust broadly. Let me turn it back to you then on a specific issue as it relates to trust in the industry that you've been uh, sort of front and center on. Yeah. We've had a prescription drug crisis in the United States, yeah. Yeah. more opiate-related dr uh, drug deaths, uh, especially in West Virginia. And yep. you've been involved in litigation as a supplier, right. whether you can you correctly right. get the blame or not. It's there, and it's just another bad headline it's, it's to reality. add to the industry yeah. problem. Yeah, so let me, that, that's actually a, an interesting example. So again, this is, this is a case where, as the distribution player in the market, we don't manufacture, we don't import, we don't define the quotas of opiates, we don't dispense, we don't uh, write prescriptions. We are essentially a supply chain manager. But in, again, in full, responsibility and accountability, we probably could have had better control systems. But we wound up being the target of that activity. So again, what happened, instead of looking at ways to coordinate between DEA, FDA, the pharmaceutical industry, the pharmacy industry, the boards of pharmacy, um, clinics and clinicians and the physicians, we spent all of our time looking for blame and trying to figure out where we can point a finger. We are just now beginning to talk about opiate abuse in the way it should be discussed, which is a broad societal issue which crosses boundaries, which has huge complex root cause issues, and which requires coordination. Coordination is sort of the key to this. And, and by the way, there's no incentive. There's a, you know, there's a huge problem with society. It's partly due to a breakdown in the social fabric in, 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 in parts of the country. It's due to the, readil, the availability of these drugs. But it's also because there's no premium that's paid for uh, deterrent-proof drugs. So, you know, we're wringing our hands. <coughs> we have simple release drugs, and the insurers won't give you a different price if you produce a drug that, drug that can't be abused. So there's what no incentive to create 
Where's um, biotech on all of this? I mean, has biotech found its voice within some of these issues as a fairly new part of the industry? Well, we've touched on a lot of issues. I don't know yeah. which one you want to go to first. We haven't touched on opioid abuse. That is a, I agree though, that is a huge issue. If you think about where trust is lacking right now, the families of people who have kids or young adults who are addicted, they don't know where to go and they're not getting any help. That part of the system is, is absolutely broken and I do think it was astonishingly silent during the election cycle about this yep, problem, absolutely. which is huge. We see it most um, acutely because the, if you abuse opioids, your chances of getting hep C are very high. So where we see outbreaks, we know there's opioids, and it's just everywhere. It's really shocking everywhere, small towns all over the world. Um, in terms of, um, I want to echo some of the things that Ian said. I mean, talking about um, the system that we're in where, and, and what George said, there are always going to be opportunists. And the system that we're in allows that to occur because of the regulatory nature of our business. Factories get obsolete. People move out of making products because it becomes unprofitable if they have to reinvest in these in these institutions. We were talking in the green room beforehand about, you know, it takes five years to put a pharmaceutical plant in place. It takes three years to tra to transfer a product line from one group to another. It's a lot of work and a lot of expense, and so opportunists can take advantage of that. And that's some of what we saw in some of the headlines that were created because of the nature of our business. When plants get obsolete, it's hard to reinvest in the generics industry. Um, in terms of the trust between us and our patients, uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting because we have done so much to make the experience better for patients. We have invested lots of money, lots of time, lots of effort in making things better for patients. A good example of that is, you know, in HIV you have to take multiple medications. And you know what we figured out? Patients weren't always taking all their medications. Sometimes they take some, sometimes they take none. Taking none is okay, but taking only part of your regimen is really bad. And so what happens when you do that? You become resistant to a virus that you can then spread to other. And there were incredible um, predictions of, of multi-drug resistant HIV being everywhere uh, going back 20 years. Well, 10 years ago, we came up with an idea for a single tablet regimen. What's, what's the importance of that? It's just one pill. Well, it's one pill instead of two, and so you can only make uh, two choices. You take it, you get the benefit, you don't take it, you don't get the benefit. That concept took hold in HIV and the rate of resistance is now much lower than it's ever been. So we've created a better environment long term for the patient and the doctor. In fact, the doctors do complain that their, their practices are getting boring because they have less complicated things to deal with these days. And that's good. We've made medicine boring for these people because we've made it easy. So this is the kind of stuff that biotech does, the thing that pharma does all the time. We're thinking about how to make the patient's life better. Maybe it's about lack of, of information, Franz, lack, lack of transparency. Sure. As a patient, do you have access to this kind of information and these choices? And as doctors, I think it would do be you? good to, to yeah. talk a bit for, about what does it take to to get, get it right, yeah. right? Because Please. otherwise we, we get hung up on, uh, on, 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 the, on the issue of the week. Um, I see a lot of advance in the coming years. Data, uh, internet of things uh, will play a big role in it. And um, that could be overwhelming because what we also heard from this Edelman study is that change is not necessarily perceived as good. It unsettles people. Uh, so communication is very important. And when somebody has a disease, we need to communicate along the uh, care pathway uh, because in the end, a cancer patient needs to be followed through all along the cycle of treatment all the way to recovery, hopefully. Um, whereas a cardiovascular patient needs a different communication. So we need to bring information together uh, that today is carved into silos. And I think there is certainly technology can play a big role to make sure that patients perceive the care to be delivered around them. Whether it's from specialist A, B, or C, their primary care doctor, the information about the medication, uh, the information being all together so that nothing gets lost, mistakes are not made, and I think it will have a tremendous effect on outcomes and on productivity. And so I think this is where we are all heading, and it also requires deeper collaboration between us, because um, giving a, 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 a medication, if we can prove that it works, right? if you can have a feedback loop through the cloud, through data, and where we can also measure the compliance that we just talked about, right? so that, that we know that the patient is following the regime, 
Um, you close the loop, information uh, gets delivered, uh, and I think everybody will gain from that. So I think we need to integrate the healthcare system further. Everybody, everybody wants yeah, to be in here. Um, again, just in the, in, the, in the spirit of what can we do, I'm going to give you an mm -hmm. example of something, and it, and it is about the patient. So just as a pilot in 2011, the Ohio Children's Hospitals did a collaboration we call the Solutions for Patient Safety. We started this with some children's hospitals that expanded to the adult hospitals, started with 11 hospitals. Um, looking at um, improving, we know that um, adverse events happen in hospitals or in all of our healthcare facilities, and that we have to be accountable for those. Um, we set bold goals. We agreed that we were going to share information uh, across the board. Things that happen to patients things, while things they're already in the hospital. Things that happen to patients on our watch. Yeah. Okay. Staff infections, stuff um, like that. All kinds of things. Um, um, ventilator acquired infections, um, uh, uh, surgical site infections, okay, m many, many of the, the factors we monitor. Uh, pressure, uh, wounds, et cetera. Bold goals, transparency, sharing information across the systems, including bringing the boards involved and the patients and their families. That collaboration now has over 100 hospitals. Virtually every children's hospital in the country is participating in this initiative. And we're dramatically reducing infection rates, dramatically reducing infection rates. And it's happening because people are coordinating, they're sharing data, and most of those institutions are actually publishing their data on their own issues, on adverse events happening in their hospitals, and the patients can see that data. That is powerful. That's the kind of solution, but it requires coordination. And data. And, and data, and again, you've, you've, not a search for blame. You've teed solutions. up, uh, Rich, pretty remarkably. You've just done a tremendous comprehensive study on this very issue. Exactly, and to build on the same year, we just published uh, with John, some researchers from John Hop, Johns Hopkins and University of Michigan. Uh, there was only one year where the federal government asked for hospitals and counties to submit data in a way that you could track it to the in, either institution or county level. And we went back and there were 22 million patient records from that year. And we went and looked at the risks of a set of diseases, of prevention elements, of safety related elements. And we found in that data set remarkable variation, remarkable. 10 to 1 on safety related issues inside hospitals, 2 to 1 on myocardial infarction. And when you tear it apart and you say, well, maybe that's because the patients were sicker, they were had comorbidities, they had other factors, that only explained 30, per, 30 to 50 percent of the variation. So half of this enormous variation between top performing and underperforming hospitals and geographies is driven by unexplained factors, likely processes that exist in the institutions and the ways they operate. Operate. And you say, how can that persist? So some of it, as we discussed earlier in this, is because of the fragmented nature of the industry. And some of it is around the regulatory challenges that we're dealing with. But some of it is we've grown up in a world where tracking outcomes in a transparent way just isn't done. The data isn't collected in a systematic way. After 2011, the government changed the rules in response to requests, and that data hasn't been collected since then. And so I think one of the responsibilities, on top of the other elements that have been discussed, is how to create more outcomes transparency, to allow the industry to coordinate across the value chain, to allow the people that are coming up with innovation, even if it's very high-priced innovation, but that's meaningfully having benefit across the system, to be able to be rewarded for that, to encourage investment in that, and to frankly set a higher bar for institutions to up their game. This isn't about hospitals not wanting to do great stuff. Yeah, Every hospital has physicians who care. But, but institutions, when you don't have outcomes data, it's hard. And where we've had outcomes data, if you look at hip and knee replacements in Sweden, if you look at uh, uh, the Martini Clinic in Germany on prostate treatment, if you look at cystic fibrosis in the US, if you look at the story George just told, when we get to environments where there's more transparency, that different institutions can see what best practices is, have an incentive to learn, then the potential to get improvement is dramatic, and the reward for those who make that happen is very high. But I would argue that you know this is all this is all true, undisputedly, but it's missing the point. The point going back to the original loss of trust. Why have politicians lost trust? Because the population doesn't believe they're working for them. 
Why has the health, can, health industry lost trust? For the same reason, the patient isn't at the center. The patient feels that the parts of the system making money off them mm -hmm. are not really focused on them as a patient. And so I think you have to start from the patient and then start, and I believe, in, in market-based incentives. So who should look after the patient? The insurance companies are not a good surrogate because there's too much churn. They're not interested in long-term health outcomes because they don't hold the patient long enough. But in the United States and Europe, 90% of the time, the hospital and the doctor groups in the geographic area hold the patient for all of their life. More and more so now in the United States as hospitals are buying up do doctor practices. So for me, you get rid of all of these tactical issues if you simply say, you're going to put the risk of patient wellness or care on the providers. You can use insurance companies to evaluate the risk in their inherent population, but you need to say to the providers, we're not paying you for how many MRIs you do, we're not paying you for how many emergency exits you do, we're not paying you how many scans you do, we're paying you if your population gets healthier. And, we'll, and so the doctors are best placed to take that risk and decide what to do about it. So they will pick the best medicine, value-based medicine, if they believe that will make their population healthier. They will invest in smoking cessation if they believe, because they're stuck with a long-term cost of that patient population. Mm -hmm. So all of their incentives are focused on getting that population healthy. And that solves all of the... It, then the, every incentive is aligned. They're going to use the right technologies. They're going to do home care. Is uh, anybody talking about this? Is this yeah, realistic? Yeah, this is happening as What's we happening? speak. Right? I mean, no, we, we have partnered, for example, with Westchester uh, Health in, uh, in New York, where um, there's an active outreach program to the community. It involves the community doctors uh, right. in order to, to influence uh, behavior of consumers and to try to find an earlier intervention point before uh, health issues escalate to the point where they are becoming very costly. Um, so I think the, I also see it in other countries where uh, doctors, providers take more accountability for the system. So I think we are on a good path and data is certainly going to enable it. Um, home care and telehealth are going to make this more efficient. And I would hope to see that through telehealth, doctors can be in a proactive coaching role rather than in a reactive, you know, paper volume. And they have to be at risk. And they have to be at risk. They have, the incentive has to be, you're a physician group, you have these patients for the next 50 years, if you don't make them healthy, you're going to lose money. And, so I think and, and everything else flows from that. I agree with you. I think we're talking about four things that together become very powerful. One is more end-to-end -end ownership mm -hmm. of the patient with a longer-term perspective rather than the, the way it's cut up today. A second is an alignment of this, the incentives in the system around patient wellness and around long-term health. A third is investments in technology, both classic therapy and, te and, and medical technology as well as on data and digital technology to be able to supplement that. And the fourth is better track of outcomes and, and, co and collated in a way so that people can access it and leverage it and creating more of a best practice environment to learn. And if you put those four elements together, patients start to feel that they are back more at the center of things and that there is more of an opportunity to, to rebuild some trust in the system. <coughs> Absent those four, people, I agree, think the system's not in it for them. But you need government too, right, Ian? Well, you need government to appoint the insurers as the, as the, or some entity, not necessarily the insurers, as initially saying what is the sickness index of the population that the hospital is treating, so they can give them through insurance enough money to treat that population, and then to set five-year goals where they'll pay them less as they move towards healthiness. So you need a government role there. But you need the hospital, because all of this issue of data and medical records and all that stuff has to flow from why did the hospital want it? Why do they need it? You know, for data, Wall Street has data, because they need it and they pay for it. Hospitals wouldn't have all these crazy systems if they couldn't charge per event. They'd have one data source, they'd become efficient. So you've got to just put the incentives there and the rest will flow. Do you agree, George? Yeah, I, mean, I think some of this is actually in motion. Again, this has been a little bit U.S.-centric for the last couple of minutes, yeah. so apologize to those. That would have been working um, in Europe too, by the way. Yeah. It work in Europe too. Yeah, no, I th and I think you're saying it, it, it has. Um, some of the activities, were, I mean, we've got no providers here sitting at the, right. at the panel, but there are some in the, in the room. 
And I think some would say that we are doing these things. We are uh, beginning to drive, drive data. We're beginning to um, share information with our uh, patients. We are coordinating care with a sort of a, almost a general contractor of care in a much different way. And I, I think those are all important. I do think the incentive systems obviously uh, played a critical role in alignment. But um, I actually see some of the changes happening. And this, to some extent, it goes back to the level of trust. Some of the good things happening um, are not really interesting stories at a time where people are angry. Right? Mm -hmm. It's just not a great headline. But there are some really important things happening underneath the surface, probably in every one of our businesses, in ways that are really powerful. Yes. And uh, so, so I, I think those are really becoming about the patient. And I think when we make it about the patient, we increase trust. I was with an insurer a few years ago, the head of one of the companies. And their perfect world would be if doctors disappeared. That was his comment. If doctors disappear? disappeared? Because they know how to treat you. They know what the 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 the, med, the uh, what the protocols would say how you be treated, and the doctors just keep on getting in the way. They keep on wanting different technologies and different medicines and increasing the cost. I mean, that was the face of view. If I could only just get rid of the doctor and have the patient treated on protocols that we've set up, costs would go away. I mean, that's kind of what's happening. I think that's kind of the heart of why they're why patients are unhappy. I know. The, the physician has lost control, and that, that relationship yeah. with the patient has been destroyed. So, turn it back and, to the And so the, you, know, you go into your doctor, your doctor says you need this procedure, or you need that scan, or you need that medicine, and the first thing that happens is you find out you need a prior authorization, and you're turned down. And now you've got to go back, and you've got to fight for your rights. You have to advocate. And the system seems to me to be geared towards hoping that enough people just give up and don't get the medication or don't get the scan or don't get the procedure they need. Perhaps they didn't really need it. And, and it's happening more and more frequently. And the complexity of a doctor's life is pretty awful right now yep. in terms of the prior authorization forms that you need to go mm -hmm. through. And, and God forbid you make a mistake in any box in that because it's out. And then you've got to go and fight and advocate on now, behalf of your patients. Would still have to, this hospitals yep. would still have to have an insurance system that pushes people towards value insurance, yeah. they still have to say, no, you don't need an MRI. Not, oh, we'll give you one because we've got a machine that's sitting yeah. on the floor and needs to be used. So there would be a lot of, the, but, but it would be more of a dialogue between the patient and the, and the individual. And if the individual said, well, I want one, they say, okay, but it's not covered by insurance. On my medical but advice, you don't need it. That, doctors in the room, insurers, I'm sure we have plenty of way. And get your questions ready. I'll take well, them in, in a moment. Hopefully the, uh, yeah. the, new, the, new, the new head of... Um, but, but even that's hard. You go to, I was at my doctor. This is a physician. Yeah. And I, think well, I was just going to ask you about what you're going to expect from well, the Well, I hope new. Dr. Price would have some of those ideas. I haven't talked to him. I don't know, but he's... If he's, he gets confirmed. He's He's, if he gets confirmed, I think he's very, very focused on putting patients at the center. Um, does doctor. any country get this right? No. No. That's, that's the concerning thing. There isn't one Well, but there are system. countries where the satisfaction of patients are, uh, is significantly higher. That's true. There, there are countries where the productivity is significantly higher, where the waste is less. So let's say there's best practices to share. Uh, I refuse to make this a pessimistic dialogue. You know, there, no, <laughs> I think that would be wrong. Patients are happier. Patients are happier when they have no information. Happiness is a relative state. You know, there are, there are health care systems that... that apparently satisfy the needs because the population know, doesn't know the alternatives in well, many cases. There's a huge repression of knowledge being given to patients about I think earlier we spoke about the need for more transparency, so let's hold that and let's not think that less information is better. More, t more information is going to happen. Um, with uh, precision medicine, let's say the effectiveness of treatment will go up, the, the preciseness of diagnosis will go up. Uh, so I think we need to spend more time or maybe on the governance of uh, payers and, and, and delivery of care. Uh, but all over the world, and we have been too focused on the US, you know, many regions in the world, the average health is improving. Right. Uh, we have been, as well as pioneering primary care in African countries in order to early detect uh, moms with, the, with issues with their baby in order to reduce child mortality, infant mortality. That's working. Right. So there's widely advancements uh, in the delivery of care in, in many regions. Um, and we should not only look at the excesses. I agree with that. And as Ian mentioned, the trust issue is maybe one that's more unique to some of the developed economies like the U.S. Yeah. And I think, inf again, information, uh, the whole notion of outcome, outcomes-based is hard. You, you know that we, we struggle with how to measure that. 
But I think the notion of evidence-based is really important. And mm -hmm. I do think that the world has changed in a lot of ways that people don't see. I think you know, if you go back 10 or 15 years ago where you could have you know, 10 beta blockers and the 10th would still have a, have a market that looked somewhat like the first, you know, it's different. I think people want real innovation now. And where that occurs should be rewarded. Um, so I think we'll, we're, you know, the evidence is going to going to carry the day to some extent. I think that's, that's, a, that's not a bad thing. But I think, again, patients involved in it, um, physicians really working with evidence-based activity, pharmaceutical companies providing the data. It's, it's, all, it's all part of the same direction. I think that's a It's, that's it's something you guys do a lot of work on. I know outcomes-based, evidence-based, they can be squishy terms if you're not squishy, inside yes. of the yep. industry. So what does but, uh, that even mean, value-based healthcare? So, Values-based healthcare is the outcomes produced for patients from a patient-centric view relative to the costs required to deliver those outcomes, and that's that's that is the essence of value-based healthcare. And I think we've been really encouraged to see how much that dialogue has taken hold in recent years. Translated into reality is still hard. I agree, this is a journey. But you know, there was a group that we were a part of forming, ICHOM, which is the International Consortium of Health Outcomes Measurement. It's now got half of the world's disease burden where we tried to align around the world on how to have a set of patient-centric outcomes orientations that can be tracked in a consistent way, start to build databases that will allow people to compare the efficacy of different approaches, allow for sharing of practices, and allow for sharing of expectations in terms of results. I think the OECD, as we speak literally this week, is in a discussion around how to be able to drive more of an outcome-centric view of the world and not just a component cost-centric view of the world that does not serve patients well and has produced a lot of frustration for patients. It's not that complicated. There are six diseases or five diseases that make up the vast majority of healthcare expenses. It's cardiovascular, it's lipids, it's diabetes, it's hypertension, um, there's a couple others, cancer. You know, they're not, it's not complicated. You've got to get people, you've got to get focused on the patient and ensure the lifestyles and the way the, 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 the individual takes responsibility, uh, the, the incentives are there for that. And a lot of these problems will cure themselves. Can we take some questions from around the room? I know we have many. Please. <laughs> oh, sorry. It's coming. Thank you. I basically agree with you on that uh, politicians might not be very well briefed as yet. <laughs> But they all quite well know that uh, innovation is a scarce uh, value because we, you all talk about values and how you measure the outcomes and evidence-based. And at the end, it comes to how you price it. So big pharma has a simply gloomy future the way it's acted the last 30, 40 years by simply uh, pricing the so-called innovation the way they uh, measure through how much money they need to reestablish themselves or to develop or the rest. So how do you feel about having something, because you're Brit and you, you, you're privileged in a way, you're not nice, the National Institute of Clinical you Excellence. Come to your question. So the question is, if they introduce this in the United States, what's going to be the future of the big pharma? Well, you know what, the, um, I don't know what the future of patients would be. I'd be more worried about the patients than the future of big pharma. There will be, there'll be, there'll be, there'll be, there'll be a grinding halt to it research. I mean, the truth is that the profit pools are such that the U.S. consumer is paying for all the innovation. The rest of the countries are free riding, including Europe, free riding on a U.S. expense. And that's a trade issue. It's also a societal issue. So, so you don't, the trouble with medicines is any medicine that's successful is hugely profitable. But you don't pay for the ones that are successful. You pay for a modern pharmaceutical industry that has an incredible failure rate because we don't know enough. And we spend, you know, sometimes 20 years bringing a product to market. You pay for the medicines when you pay for them on the value they deliver, and which is hard for us. They have to be really valuable. But that cash flow from those medicines have to support the whole infrastructure. I think we have a question in the back. Yes, I'm Tamer from Saudi Arabia. I'm in the, engaged in the healthcare industry, from trading to manufacturing. My question is that trust is the key word I see today. And I believe all stakeholders lost their trust. Regulators lost their trust when they didn't do their job. Consumer 
cannot be trusted because he's ignorant, doesn't have the right information. But I still ask myself one question. All this trust is because we haven't been doing our job. Everybody's role is clear, but where is the role of the pharma, big pharma industry, where, where they had their failure of trust? We must have the courage to really see where did we go wrong. My second, yeah. Well, I'll stop on this one. Yeah, well, if you're, okay. I don't know if anyone wants to answer that. I mean, I would, I would so say, that, I, well, for me, I would say that, that you know, our, our responsibility is to find uh, cures and improvements in quality of life for individuals. Ooh, where did we go wrong? That, that, I don't think we did. I think Communication, we, maybe? Maybe, maybe. I think, look at, look at what you've got now. Can you imagine, can you imagine your father, you, you, going back, or your child, going back to when your father was born and going to a doctor and saying, I've got this problem, I've got hypertension. It was, there was no products. The, all the diseases we have that are now controlled or semi-controlled, you go back 40 years, there was nothing. Or 50 or 60, I'm, I'm getting old. 60 years you go back, there was nothing in the pharmacies. It would be like, it would be like well, I can bleed you. I can give you some palliative, but I really can't help you. I think the industry has done a huge amount. Now, where have we gone wrong? Where we've gone, did we lose our trust? We, we lost our trust because we stopped being, we stopped talking to the patient. We talked to the physicians who were the power, and then the physicians lost the power, and it was the insurance companies, and we talked to the insurance companies, and we lost the ability to talk to patients directly. Questions around the room? One in the back. There's behind you there. <clears throat> There's one here, and then we'll go around. We've got time. Uh, sorry, Ian, uh, this one's probably for you, but you guys could all address it. Um, <clears throat> Donald Trump has said specifically that he's going to try to lower drug prices as part of his health care plans. Um, and he said that's going to be a central part of his plan. He's going to use his bully pulpit, which I think means Twitter, to make this happen. You've already said you don't think that he understands. He'll be briefed and he'll understand more. What will he know in six months? that he doesn't know today? And how are all of you thinking about this? Because this is a completely, this is a complete wild card for you. What are you talking about with your executives? What is the communication well, strategy? How do you get inside his head to understand what you need him well, to? Well, what I tell you is that, you know, you can interpret these words in many ways, and I'm not trying to interpret them, but one way of lowering healthcare costs is have more innovation and more competition. So pay more for medicine so that we can develop more medicines and we can drive through competition lower costs. I don't know what he means by saying lowering drug prices. I know that's the best way to lower drug prices, is to get more competition in the marketplace. Now, I think what he doesn't realize is that the United States spends 2% of its GDP on pharmaceuticals. Other OECD countries spend 1.5 or less. Half of a point of GDP, the United States is spending more, and for that they get a 1.6 trillion GDP contribution from the industry. I think Wait those a second. That's not, that's not the narrative. That's not how it's been spun at all. But that's how it is. If you look at, we spend, in the United States, we spend 17% on health care. And OECD spends 9. There are 8 points of difference of GDP. Of those 8 points, a half a point is attributable to the cost of medicines. The rest is attributable to physicians, hospitals, and, and taxes and fees. Mm. The issue is not the cost of medicines. In fact, a lot of countries spend more as a percentage of their healthcare medicines than they spend on than the United States because they've seen medicines as a way of controlling costs. So I think you know it's a matter of public policy and a matter of having a dialogue with the administration. And and I expect that you know we there will be a um, an understanding from both parts. Did you have? No, there was a question yeah. behind you. Thank you for the panel, Steve Roskosker, Best Diagnostics, good to see you all. <clears throat> and um, consistent with what we were just talking about, getting off of uh, drug prices, <clears throat> it has to do with um, raising transparency around prices in general. <clears throat> we all know that, um, and this is a U.S. discussion, and yes, I do agree, Franz, that the Netherlands has a good system. They do agree. But in the U.S., uh, if you think about the healthcare system, we have Medicare about 45 million lives. We have Medicaid about 120 million lives, and the rest is paid for by large employers and by the consumer. And there's wide variation in the prices with the consumer. And so, you know, the question is, which gets back a little bit to can it really be a workable solution that hospitals and physicians own the patient since the patient is portable, 
What can we do to get more variation reporting around prices broadly? What prices? Provider prices, physician prices, procedure prices, prices, lab prices, radiology prices. Prices Anybody in have general have wide you, variation in the United States. And so what, what, would, what could we do with that information? Consumers are making choices. So they'll decide whether to go or yeah, not to go I'm to all, I'm all for you. I'm all with you. It goes back to, to what George yeah. said. You yeah. know, if you make transparent what the entire procedure uh, and the handling of the patient cost, outcomes versus all the effort. We all know that there is waste in the system. So you can have a quality indicator, you have a cost indicator, and then the market can do its job to optimize it. I mean, I, I think we're going to see more transparency, whether we like it or not, in pricing, which is easier. The bigger challenge to me in some ways is quality. I'm a consumer. I make a decision about a car. I know what the cost is. It's very clear. I know what the attributes of the car I want, and I know how to value that. It's very difficult for most consumers to say, I know the difference between this procedure and that procedure and these sites of care. So I do think there are two dimensions to this. One is transparency on price, which I personally think it's going to happen one way or the other through a, an app that somebody creates. We're seeing more of it today. But we'll see what's a bigger challenge, and I think could be a bigger inflection point, is actually transparency on, uh, on, on outcomes and um, on quality. And I think that's a really important dynamic. And, and that's, in some ways, a, a bigger challenge, Steve, in my view. And just to build on that, <clears throat> Informing patients more about individual costs of procedures or other things, absent a holistic view of what's in the best interest of the patient in an outcome-centric way, is not necessarily leading to better care for them. And the challenge with the U.S. system is the fragmentation across the different parts of the system is so enormous. The question seems like the obvious answer, just create more transparency. But in fact, if we don't start with an outcomes-driven approach, if we don't start with trying to get the incentives aligned from the providers of care through the end of the system, it's not obvious that you get to a better result for the patient no, but if the by provider doing that. Owns the outcome. Right. If the provider owns the outcome and he's <clears throat> compensated and paid by that, then you'll get it right. The other thing, we've spent a lot of our time talking about price, which I understand, and it is the, it's, it, it's, it's the headline. I got it, it's hot, it's, and, it's, and it's not a trivial issue. Utilization is another issue which is a huge, huge dynamic. Again, this goes back to the incentive system. So I do think, again, if you look at the overall spend, and I think it's roughly, Rich, you know this, what, 15 or 16 percent is pharmaceuticals, and the rest is, right. is medical. Some component of that is price, and some, com this is the US, again, some component is utilization. And we've had a system in which we've encouraged, essentially, more utilization of healthcare activities. And so if we, we're going to have to wrestle with that, particularly with the demographics driving more demand, which is for sure to happen. So we've got to think carefully about, again, how do we, um, how do we get enough alignment incentives, and this goes back to the paying for the right stuff, so that utilization per capita is, uh, is, is moderated in some way. Um, because we're going to have an aging population, and they're going to need pharmaceutical products, and they're, they're going to need hips, and that's a reality. And how do you use the industry in that effort? I mean, the law, the thicket of laws are so problematical. Uh, if you take, for instance, um, Tony Cosgrove in the Cleveland Clinic, because of the laws in that state. He can test for cigarette smoking. Ongoing. Takes a bit of your hair and checks. If you're smoking, you don't work there. That's his attempt to drive down costs for his <coughs> institution. If you have a certain weight, you can't work there because they've done tests showing you can't, you're not capable of performing some of the activities needed in a hospital. <coughs> so, you know, they have, smoke, they have drug testing. A lot of this can be driven by the private enterprise too. Well, I, as a as a of a company, I want to drive my my healthcare costs down, so I want to select the people who come into the company so that I can help them be as healthy as possible. So these are changes and regulations and facilitations we could do for all of us to get on this issue. Like we provide gyms, we provide is that, them. <coughs> is that an inclusive approach, or are you pushing certain people out of your system? No. If somebody comes to apply, well. My, my opinion is this. If somebody, I don't know what our position is now, actually, but I'm using the Cleveland Clinic because I know where the laws are there. You go to the Cleveland Clinic and you're a smoker, they won't hire you. If, you, if They would probably say to you, go away, come back in three months, we'll drug test you. If you're free of cigarettes, we'll hire you. Okay, so there, it's there, exclusive. There's an improvement loop. Uh, there's an improvement loop. There's okay, always good. an improvement loop. We have drug testing in certain states. Mm -hmm. You don't get fired the first time. 
You get, you were told you were drugs. We're going to test you randomly at a point in the future. You get one chance. Okay, so you're influencing healthy behavior. You're influencing healthy behavior. That's good. By That's letting, good. sort of self-regulating. We want to take some more questions. Uh, my name is Anjara Jackson. I'm a physician in the United States. And I think we hear a lot about patient-centric and community-based outcomes in hospitals and physicians taking ownership for those outcomes. But what you just said is a perfect segue into what my point is, and that is the individual patient's responsibility. We need to spend more health care dollars in terms of prevention, and we pay our primary care providers the least amount of money. We don't have those kinds of programs across the board. What would you do if the hospital owned that? The time the physician spends convincing the patient <coughs> to be healthy would be reimbursed. It isn't today. Because well, it, it would be the interest of the hospital. It should be. There and it go. would be. And it would be in the interest of the insurance companies as well to keep patients, popul to keep the population healthy. So I think we really need to, we're talking about the end. When people have disease, when they need intervention, we talk about physicians ordering too many tests. Well, part of it in the United States is also based on the fact that we live in such a litigious-minded society <laughs> that if you miss something, you're going to be on the other end of a lawsuit. So there are so many factors that go into bringing down health care costs, bringing back trust into the health care system, and I really think we need to put more emphasis on prevention and early uh, health care efforts <clears throat> as opposed to putting Absolutely. all of our eggs at the end. Oh, thank totally you for right. your comment. Totally. Uh, we only have a few minutes left. I do want to give everybody on the panel a chance to sort of sum it up and give us a, a bottom line. Um, it does feel like some of the news of the day items on pricing, on sort of demonizing the pharma and healthcare industry can be solved by fixing problems that patients and I think the public aren't as aware of, things that we talked about on this panel, like improving wait times, increasing transparency <coughs> on outcomes, letting patients make better decisions, bringing more efficiency into the system and value, less dependent on profits and more centered around patients. So it, John, maybe you can kick it off and just give us a final bottom line prediction and sort of view forward of what you, what you expect and how you expect I'll, I'll, I, I, I'm not going to give you a prediction. I'll give you a hope. Okay. I, I don't know how to predict what's going on right now. Right. Nobody wants I, to predict. I think in all the systems around the world where systems work very well is where physicians uh, like Dr. Jackson can, can work with their patient and don't have an onerous regulatory system around them. I think that's one of the big problems we have right now. <laughs> it's difficult for doctors to prescribe what they want. It's difficult for patients to know what to do if they're denied that. And they're often then asked to pay really significantly onerous co-pays these days. That's, I think, one of the other sources of anger that we didn't talk about. The co-pays have ratcheted mm -hmm. up somewhat because of the plans under the ACA, somewhat uh, because of the PBMs have used that as, another way, as another way to extract, um, uh, to take cost out of the system while raising premiums. So it's been a very... It's, it's been a very poor experience for the healthcare consumer over the last four years. They're happiest, patients are happiest, certainly our HIV patients, our HCV patients, when that, that relationship with the doctor uh, is, is considered sacrosanct and when they can make those decisions and have that kind of interaction that you would want when you go into your doctor. I would hope that whatever we come up with uh, to replace the ACA could solidify that relationship. A hope, a prediction, or a solution? Anybody makes predictions these days. It's yeah. risk, right? <clears throat> so I won't make a prediction. Just a few closing comments. Again, I think I keep wanting to push us back to the issue of trust, not just being about health care. I think all of us run corporations. We have opportunities to operate in our communities on matters related to health care and not. And I think everything that we can do that helps build that trust is beneficial to us as healthcare players, number one. Inside of health care, um, increased flow of information, coordination among players, uh, breaking up those components of care that tend to um, break down trust, break down efficiency, and make care less uh, optimized or important for us. And um, again, if, to the extent that we can put the patient at the center of the universe and share information with them about their care, um, I think we're, we're well served. 
So I would say, I'll make a prediction. I'm actually genuinely optimistic, and I know the tone of this panel and the concerns that we're moving in a direction towards value-based healthcare and towards more outcomes transparency. And partly it's facilitated by data in the world we live in, and partly it's by a recognition of the importance of doing that. And I think if we do that, then we put a lot of emphasis back where Ian was going on giving more power to people who can take an end-to-end -end view of the patient and do a more holistic view of both the value creation and the cost components in mind. That will be harder, particularly in the United States, because of the fragmentation in the system. And then the third element is a lot of the headlines you pointed to were really not the behavior of the main industry players. It was outlier behavior. So I think one of the questions is how to, whether it's market discipline, industry discipline, or others, hopefully short of sort of legal and new laws, how to get some disciplining to prevent some of the outlier behavior, which then throw the, the trust of the whole industry into question and don't serve anyone, and frankly, don't serve the patient to the extent it deters innovation and deters sort of investing in, in better healthcare systems. I think it's Prediction. data, outcomes used by the providers who are at risk for the health of their community. The patient has to have a, a skin in the game. They have to have, they have to pay more for things they don't need, which is what value-based insurance is about. But in the end, we are at the beginning I think of the next 20 years of, of radical new inventions in medicines. We are just at the beginning. We're really beginning to crack the biological code. You know, you've got gene editing, you've got gene therapy, you've got uh, using the immune system. I mean, a big oasis still not tapped is, is, is neurology. Uh, but I'm really optimistic about what science can do in the next 20 years. No matter who's president? No matter who's president, as long as society <laughs> is willing to pay. And Donald Trump, friend or foe to the pharma industry? I think he's, um, he's going to be somebody who wants to make sure patients are well cared for. So my takeaway, my final conclusion, uh, they'll put the patient at the center, they'll connect it through the cloud to the doctor, everything will become transparent, and precision health, I think, is going to drive better outcomes. Um, and we will get to a higher productivity. So I'm hopeful for the future. Uh, it will require us to collaborate more, and if in, in certainly some countries, the relationships between all the, the actors need to become de-siloed, because that's the only way to get breakthroughs. And technology is coming no matter what? Technology is going to come no matter what, and it will actually be a great integrator. Uh, we, we can trust our financial health to the cloud. Right? We find that normal already for 20 years. So it is about time to really stitch up the entire healthcare system end-to-end -end, uh, through technology. We'll leave it on that optimistic note. Thank you all very much for this discussion. Thank you for joining us.